Hey everyone, my name is Tomato Anus, also known as Microscope Required, and this is an any percent speedrun of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild on the Nintendo Switch. This run is actually performed by Rosin Earns, a top runner for the game, who also helped me write the script to make sure it's all as accurate as possible. If you'd prefer to watch this run without commentary or Rosin's current personal best, there are links in the description. This is an any percent run, so glitches are allowed, but if you'd prefer to watch a run less reliant on glitches, there's a link to the current bug limit any percent record by LuluCore in the description as well. Real quick, here's a breakdown if you're unfamiliar with Breath of the Wild and how it's structured. 100 years ago, in the land of Hyrule, there was a battle between the evil Calamity Ganon and the forces of good, made up by some princess, a warrior named Zelda, and four champions of Hyrule's different races. We lost, Ganon won, and now Zelda is become Ancoma. Now, in the present day, Zelda wakes up and sets off to defeat Ganon. That's about it. There isn't a whole lot of structure to the game. Defeating Calamity Ganon is the main goal. With all that stated, let's get into the run. Hello? Hey Chicago guy, I bought a new phone so you can hear me over the wind. So what are you doing with the million dollars you won? Buying a time machine on eBay? Aren't you worried though that the man is going to see what you're doing? No, because I'm using ExpressVPN. What's that? Watch ExpressVPN? It's a VPN service that encrypts your data and masks your IP address while still maintaining super fast speeds. That way, I don't have to worry about the man collecting and selling my data to ad companies or surveilling and harvesting my data for their own agenda. Plus, they're rated the number one VPN provider by CNET, The Verge, Wired, TechRadar, and more. Oh, I love Wired. I know you don't. ExpressVPN is so easy to use that even a lazy bum from Wisconsin can figure it out. All you have to do is press one button and you're set. And it even lets you change your location online too. You know how we watch Naruto Shippuden every Thursday night for date night? Well, that actually isn't available on Netflix in the States, so I use ExpressVPN to access the Canadian Netflix library so we can watch it. You can actually find out how to get three months free by clicking the link in the description box below and going to expressvpn.com slash anus. Anus? Yep, that's right, expressvpn.com slash anus. Wait, description box? What are you talking about? Right away, the game is played with Canadian French text and German voice because that's the fastest combination of languages when playing on an NTSC Switch, since the text box is dismissed slightly faster in some spots and the overall length of the spoken lines is shorter. So, the run officially starts when we gain control of Zelda, and we get off to a blazing start by entering into some text box dialogue when we pick up our Sheikah Slate, which is pretty much an in-game iPad for menuing and map usage. After a whopping 35 seconds of cutscenes and dialogues, we're going to continue our blistering start by mashing to click on the right analog stick to bring up the camera slash scope feature on the iPad to get a little cutscene that plays when you open it up for the first time. This is because if we don't get this little cutscene out of the way immediately, then it'll impede the first skip of the run, Shrine of Resurrection skip. Normally, when you exit the Shrine of Resurrection where we start the game, there's a lengthy cutscene of Nintendo patting themselves on the back and showing off how beautiful Hyrule is. Instead, by running up the wall and wedging ourselves up as high as we can go, and then mashing on the right analog stick again to enter the scope feature, if we're positioned correctly, then we just drop through the wall and are out of bounds, now being able to skip the intended exit of the Shrine of Resurrection and the exit cutscene. So now that we're out of bounds in the shrine, we can climb up a nearby rock face where at the top, Rosin will walk Zelda to a specific spot while crouched and then cancel the crouch to stand up where we'll get pushed back in bounds. Rosin is then going to run around the Great Plateau freezing his tush off and collect an axe, shield, bow, and arrows. While Rosin does all this, it's a good time to explain how we'll be entering the first shrine because it'll take a hot second, but make a mental note for the time being that we're able to sprint while recovering stamina during this stretch thanks to something called whistle sprinting. Remember that term, I'll explain it later. So as for the shrine, normally in this tutorial area of Hyrule called the Great Plateau, you have to activate a big tower and then complete four shrines. I don't know about you, but big towers sound slow, so we're going to skip the tower and head straight to a shrine. The exterior of shrines are set up so that you have to interact with the slab with your iPad, and then a gate will unlock and you can ride an elevator down. Typically, the four shrines in the Great Plateau aren't accessible until you activate the big tower, at which point the slabs on the exteriors of the shrines will become interactable, but you can actually enter the shrines early, skipping the big tower and slab interaction by performing what's called a shield clip. So if you jump onto a sloped angle like the side of a shrine and shield surf briefly, then the game remembers the angle the shield had in that moment while you were surfing. This angle gets stored internally in the game somewhere. 
Then, if you jump and mount your shield in air, and then unequip the shield during this animation, then Zelda will briefly become skewed with the angle that was stored internally from a shield surfing briefly on a slope. This angle is wonky enough where if we position ourselves in an exact spot next to a shrine and then perform another jump with a shield mount to activate the skew, the combination of our positioning and skew will cause Zelda to clip through the wall. I know that was a lot, but let's go through the steps as they happen here right now. First, Rosin approaches the shrine and shield surfs on its sloped side to set a skew angle internally. Rosin then positions Zelda in a precise spot and does a shield mount to activate the skew, clipping us through the wall. Inside the wall, Rosin crouched, walked up to, and interacted with the elevator to enter the shrine proper, skipping having to go to the big tower. So, inside this first shrine, once the elevator reaches the bottom, we'll interact with the slab on a pedestal, which gives us our first iPad app, Stasis. This is of course installed the traditional way with a stalactite in the shrine discharging its gamer goo onto our iPad. Now that our moist meter is filled, let's explain stasis. Stasis lets us freeze and suspend objects in time for up to 10 seconds unless we manually unfreeze them earlier, and also lets us hit objects to build up directional energy on them that all gets unleashed once the object leaves stasis. Changing topics, when we approach the last boulder in the shrine, rather than interact with it, we're going to circumvent it by performing a shield jump. Zelda is a tubular dude who likes to tear up the slopes and shreds some powder by surfing with his shield, and when we go to crush it, Zelda performs a gnarly flip in air to mount his board. And by pressing the mount button at the right time, you get a bit of extra distance and bounce to your jump, which acts as a sort of double jump like right here to cross the gap. As the kids say, most excellent. So as Rosin talks to the monk to receive the spirit orb and complete the first of four shrines in the Great Plateau, he's going to delay on when he skips the monk's final dialogue. What you think you'd do is mash to skip through the dialogue to exit out of the monk's dialogue as quickly as possible, but instead, Rosin is going to wait until the final lines from the monk's dialogue fade away. For some reason, if you skip the dialogue after the lines fade away, then the load to exit the shrine is much faster, and overall you gain control of Zelda outside of the shrine much sooner than if you had skipped the line immediately and it had to wait in a longer loading screen. When we load back outside, Hyrule Santa is going to slide into our DMs and talk to us a bit about some stuff, so while Rosin is held up in that conversation, let's talk briefly about two things that are about to break the speedrun wide open, the first of which being a stasis launch. So after telling Santa what's on his Christmas list, Rosin is going to run to a nearby boulder and use stasis on it to freeze it in place. Rosin will spin attack to hit the boulder four times to build up a bunch of energy in the boulder that will be unleashed after stasis ends, and then Rosin will shoot the boulder once with an arrow to correct the direction of the energy to be pointing pretty much straight up the nearby cliff. Rosin is then going to do something that I think is better for you to just witness rather than hear me explain, but it's worth noting in advance that the boulder we're going to use isn't just a boulder, it's a rock, and the pioneers used to ride these babies for miles. So now on top of the cliff, we're going to go to a nearby Bacoblin camp and we're going to perform something called a bullet time bounce. If we perform a jump and mount our shield, and then while falling, aim our bow and arrows to slow down time and then land on an enemy's head or back with our shield and cancel our aiming and slowing down of time, then we get an enormous launch and we can control where we land by unequipping our shield, causing us to fall straight down, and we cancel our fall damage by going to throw a weapon as we're about to land, and unequipping an item just before Zelda lets go of the weapon. Rosin then set up a new skew angle by shield surfing on a slope near the entrance of this shrine, and then shield mounts midair to perform another shield clip to enter the second shrine of the Great Plateau. This shield clip is a variation called an extended shield clip, which is the same as the shield clip I explained earlier, but is used for thicker walls like the actual shrine doors, and it's basically clipping twice instead of just once. The beginning of this shrine is pretty straightforward, with Rosin using the newly acquired Cryonis ability to make ice blocks to reach a ledge and raise a gate, so while Rosin does that, let's digress to whistle sprinting. Whistle sprinting is essentially a way to have infinite stamina and sprint non-stop. This is done by holding down the whistle button to call your horse and then mashing the sprint button. While you do regain stamina while whistle sprinting, you technically move slightly slower when compared to normal sprinting, so we alternate between normal sprinting to move as fast as possible, and then whistle sprinting to regain stamina while still maintaining near sprint speeds. While whistle sprinting mitigates a lot of stamina worries, we still have to time out when we whistle sprint versus sprint normally to make sure we have enough stamina to climb at certain parts. 
Getting back to the shrine, here Rosin is going to perform what's called Cryo Skip, which is a precisely timed shield surf jump off of a rising cryo block, which saves about 7 seconds. Righteous. Up top here is where we'll obtain our second spirit orb, and again, notice how Rosin won't skip to end the monk's dialogue until the monk's dialogue box fades away, because again, for some reason, if you skip the dialogue after the lines fade away, then the load to exit the shrine is much faster, and overall, you gain control of Zelda outside of the shrine much sooner than if you had skipped the line immediately and had to wait in a longer loading screen. So, when we load back to outside of the shrine, Rosin is going to perform a bullet time bounce that is the most difficult one in the run. It requires Zelda to both be in a rather exact spot, in addition to facing a specific angle which Rosin sets up by aiming with his bow after shooting an arrow to lure over some bokoblins. After swinging his axe a couple times to keep Zelda still while he holds up on the analog stick, Rosin leaps off and performs the bullet time bounce to launch ourselves to the third shrine of the plateau. While midair, Rosin looks up to the sky. This is because the game freezes up to load occasionally because we're traveling so fast, and looking up at the sky makes the game load slightly faster because of not having to render as many objects on screen. Because we traveled across the plateau so quickly and land so close to the shrine, the shrine entrance doesn't have time to fully load in, so we can just walk straight on into the elevator and enter the shrine without having to perform a shield clip. So this shrine is where we get the Magnesis ability, which lets us use our iPad to grab objects made of metal and move them around and manipulate their orientation. There aren't really any tricks to this shrine other than being quick with our Magnesis use to keep moving quickly, in addition to us being the awkward speedrunners we are and trying to avoid eye contact with an enemy before performing a shield jump across a gap that normally we'd need to use Magnesis to cross. This is a good time to talk about the downside to whistle sprinting, which is that Zelda makes all this noise with his whistling and just won't shut up. This is sometimes an issue because Zelda's puckered lips can alert nearby enemies and wildlife to our position. Luckily, when we need Zelda to go back to his typically mute self, we can perform what's called throw sprinting. This tech is performed by mashing the throw button and the sprint button at the same time and has the same effect as whistle sprinting. Speedrunners just prefer to use whistle sprinting because it's more consistent to perform. Throw sprinting isn't really used in this run, but it's more common in other categories and is worth the mention since we had a moment. Once we make it to the end of the shrine, we're going to talk to the monk, and we're again going to wait to skip the monk's dialogue until the final dialogue box disappears, but at this point, the repetition in this commentary about this time save must be nauseating, so I'm sorry for repeating myself about how the load is faster if we wait to skip the dialogue until after the dialogue disappears. So after the shortened loading screen that's caused by skipping the final dialogue after the lines fade away, which saves time compared to if we skip the line immediately, we'll be back outside the shrine where we're going to perform another stasis launch like the one we did earlier with the rock, but this time we're going to use a nearby metal cube that is this game's equivalent to Portal's companion cube because it's going to never leave our side for the rest of the run and you can mark my words on that. After using stasis on our buddy and loading it up with energy and directing the energy with a well-placed arrow, Rosin hops on the cube to ride it to a nearby Bokoblin camp. Here we're going to perform another bullet time bounce, and this one is incredibly frustrating because it relies on the AI of the Bokoblins cooperating, which as you can tell is a fickle situation with one of them having yeeted a barrel at us. When we eventually land from our bounce, we're going to have to perform another shield clip to enter the next shrine, because unfortunately, the shrine not being loaded just doesn't happen with this shrine in the bounce we just performed, but fortunately, it is the final shield clip of the run. So this shield clip requires Rosin to perform what's essentially two separate shield clips, where the first clip brings us to inside of the wall of the shrine, where we still have an invisible wall blocking us that we have to shield clip through as well, which has pretty much the same exact execution, iPad zooming and all. So this shrine is where we get our blue balls that explode after enough time passes, and it's by far my favorite of the shrines in this speedrun. After receiving and accepting discharge from the long hanging thing, our iPad will be powered up and have the blue balls ability, and Rosin will position himself in a super precise spot. Rosin will then perform the trick that makes this shrine so great, which is a tech called a wind bomb. So once Rosin gets his position and angle set up, he's going to jump and place one of our blue balls on the ground while jumping, and then while in mid-air, switch to our blue cube and drop that. Then switch back to the blue ball and blow it up, which causes the blue cube to be launched into us, which in turn sends Zelda flying. This is a wind bomb, and in layman's terms, we blow something up which launches an object into us, and that object sends us flying. It's like a combo shot in Pooler Billiards. 
After Zelda snaps his spine in half by landing on a ledge, we miraculously get up and Rosin will then casually heave one of our balls up to destroy some objects with cracks in them. This clears the path for us to climb on up and interact with another monk, where we will skip through its lines but then wait a moment to skip through the end of the dialogue until after the final dialogue box disappears. This is because, for some reason, if you skip the dialogue after the lines fade away, then the load to exit the shrine is much faster, and overall, you gain control of Zelda outside of the shrine much sooner than if you had skipped the line immediately and had to wait in a longer loading screen. Once we get back outside, Santa is going to float on down to us and talk for a bit before revealing himself to be the ghost of Christmas past. After Ghost Santa eventually vamooses, Rosin is going to position Zelda in a pretty exact location on the steps up to the shrine and will perform another wind bomb to send Zelda flying through the air and cartwheeling on the ground. While we wait on that, real quick, I hope you're all doing well. I know that at times it can be hard to see the positives in life, but please remember that no feeling is final. How you feel now does not define you, nor does it define the rest of your existence. There is a tomorrow, you will be here for it, and we'll all be happy that you're here with us. If things are tough, don't be afraid to reach out and talk to those close to you. Back to the run, this launch places us perfectly next to a friendly looking tree, and because it's so friendly looking, Rosin is going to prepare it for a stasis launch and then give it a nice warm hug. After wrapping our arms around the shaft, we're going to ride this tree all the way to the roof of the Temple of Time where we'll dismount from our log grip challenge and get lectured by Ghost Santa about taking his daughter to the prom. This log launch worked out to our advantage because it's not only fast, but it also lets us avoid running past a certain bokoblin on our way to the temple. This is good because after this stern talking to, we're going to perform a bullet time bounce on said bokoblin, and if we had ran up to the temple, then we may have drawn the attention of the bokoblin and it may have chased us, which would cause for it to not be in its spawn location after talking to Santa, which would mean that we wouldn't be able to perform the bounce on it. But because we did ride the log, like many of us do on Saturday nights, the bokoblin won't have moved from its spawn location, meaning we can consistently bounce on it. So, while Rosin bounces on the Bacoblin and then flies across the map, I'm going to explain a couple things real quick. When Santa stopped talking, he gave us his paraglider, which is the only way to leave the Great Plateau. You may have been asking why we didn't just launch ourselves off of the plateau earlier and cancelled our fall damage, and that's because until you have the paraglider, the plateau is surrounded by triggers that neck Zelda and you have to start over. So we need the paraglider to leave the plateau, and the only way to get the paraglider is to do all the shrines as we've already done throughout the run. As I mentioned at the start of the video, this game lacks a lot of structure, which means you can do whatever you want in whatever order, so we can just go straight to the end boss once we leave the Great Plateau, skipping all the stuff that the game suggests you typically do, like assemble your own strike force to help take down Calamity Ganon. This Phileas Fog flight path we're on is bringing us straight to the end game area where we'll do some quick prep and then do some brawling. Something that I neglected to mention at the beginning of the run is that this run does allow the use of Amiibo. If you're unfamiliar with Amiibo, they're collectible figurines you purchase in real life that you can scan with your Wii U or Switch controller for in-game rewards. Rosin has a Toon Zelda Amiibo which he activates right here, and this Amiibo spawns a tornado in a riverbed far away in a distant land that is not accessible in the game, and this tornado picks up all the fishies in the river along with a couple treasure chests and introduces them to the water cycle where they fly in the jet stream over great distances before dropping right before Zelda. After picking up some snacks for later and putting the fish in his pockets, Rosin now begins the big preparation for the final boss fights of the run because there are multiple bosses we have to beat. The first thing that Rosin does is whistle sprint down a hallway and jump so one of our blue balls will drop and then explodes the blue ball to reveal a secret room that has a royal guard sword in it. On our way out of the room, Rosin pulls out one of our blue cubes and walks to a doorway real quick at which point two things happen. One is that the cutscene that usually plays once you first arrive at the castle starts to play because enough of the castle is finally loaded in for that to happen, but also, Rosin walking into the doorway puts him in range of an enemy called a Lizalfos that was in camouflage, and entering its range causes it to leave camo and try to attack us. After gently placing down the blue cube and booking it down the hallway, we enter the armory where Rosin's whistling alerts a moblin below who we jump down to and sneak strike to take it out in one hit. We then yoink the Royal Guard's bow that was resting against the wall as well as the Moblin's Royal Guard's claymore and then strategically light an arrow on fire before igniting a wooden barrel. After destroying all the crates to collect a bunch of arrows and food, the flaming barrel ignites a bunch of leaves and we can then pull out our paraglider to ride the updraft from the fire up to the second floor where we were before we dropped down to attack the Moblin. 
Back upstairs, we're going to round the corner to see Russell Van Pelt over here messing around with the cube we dropped earlier, trying to figure out what it is, but this is where we RP as Alan Parrish and bonk them from behind to get its tri boomerang. We're now more loaded with food than a preschooler's pockets, and unfortunately it's all raw, but fortunately, Rosin is descended from a long line of Michelin star chefs and knows how to cook up some good grub. After entering the dining hall, Rosin tosses a glowing square which two moblins take to like moths to a flame. Rosin then sneak strikes one, causing the cube to roll a bit which the second moblin is completely enamored with, being completely oblivious to its friend's demise while we light an arrow on fire to light up a cooking pot, followed by brewing up a fish and mushroom skewer which gives us bonus attack damage for 3 minutes and 50 seconds after eating. We then do a cool guys don't look at explosions by detonating our moth friend's toy and then use magnesis to reach the top shelf to get down a royal bow to add to our collection. We've now got a pretty loaded arsenal, so after exiting the dining hall, Rosin positions and angles himself in a specific location and direction on a battlement and performs a wind bomb to launch Zelda up to the upper level of the castle. As we're landing from our glide, we deep throat our fish and mushroom skewer to top off our health and kick off the bonus attack timer and perform a second wind bomb which is sadly the final one in the run. When we land, we'll be entering the final boss rush of the game. Before triggering the fight, Rosin will position Zelda in a specific location and then perform a series of exact movements to get Zelda to be right on the edge of triggering the boss rush. There he aims an arrow at a specific spot and lets loose, which moves Zelda slightly forward, triggering the fight. There's an intro cutscene to the fight against the final boss, the Wind Blight, but it isn't a pre-rendered cutscene, it's actually happening in real time in the game world and the arrow we just shot just so happens to freeze in place during the cutscene. That arrow is positioned perfectly so that it's constantly colliding with the wind blight during the cutscene dealing a ton of damage so when the cutscene ends enough damage has been done to immediately finish off the wind blight effectively skipping the fight in a skip called wind blight skip. This leads to the second blight fight which is against the water blight. Right away Rosin will get a few quick pop shots in with our stone smasher with a jump thrown in there to cancel a spin attack. Rosin then runs to between the Blight's body and arm and spin attacks to have our smasher hit not only the body but also the arm of the Blight so we get two hits in on each swing. This quickly lowers the Blight's health to half which brings us to the second phase where the Blight is going to dance on the ceiling like Lionel Richie. After the Water Blight leaves its miniature Blitzball arena form at the start of Phase 2, Rosin will snipe it in its eyes twice with some arrows which will cause the Blight to drop from the ceiling. We're then going to pirouette with our Royal Claymore and try to nestle ourselves amongst its gangly limbs to get as many hits in as possible before the Blight comes to and mounts on the ceiling again. After another couple shots to the eye, Rosin performs an insanely acrobatic jumping slash with our Stone Smasher and finishes off the Water Blight to bring us to the third of four Blights, the Fire Blight. The Fire Blade is a hulking lad, but has the weakness of that it takes damage whenever we hit it. <laughs> what a stupid line. Rosin does some spin attacks with the Stone Smasher which stuns the Fire Blade and once it ragdolls to the floor we switch to the Royal Guard Sword and flail away at the Blight's armpit to bring it down to below half health and initiate phase 2. Phase 2 of the Fire Blight hits different because the Fire Blight likes to cosplay as a Hoover Vacuum. It's going to do big suck so by placing one of our blue balls on the ground, the Blight will suck it up and get blasted to the ground while Rosin will hit it a couple times with our Tri Boomerang and then switch to our Royal Claymore and spin attack the Blight's nape like it's a Titan. As the Blight stands up, Rosin deals the finishing blow bringing us to the fourth and final Blight before Ganon, the Thunder Blight. The Thunder Blight's first phase is pretty straightforward with us pulling a Thanos on its Captain America shield and then spin attacking it a couple times, it pancaking, and then spin attacking it again before it takes flight where we snipe its eye to lower its health to half, initiating phase 2. So because we just broke its vibranium shield, it of course now has its own Mjolnir that it really thinks will turn the tide of the battle. It's too bad that with just one tri boomerang throw we break its shield again, causing it to be vulnerable to another arrow shot which drops it like a bag of bricks. Rosin flails away with the tri boomerang and strong attacks the moment the blight regenerates its shield so that we destroy it again, stunning the blight and leaving it open to some devastating spin attacks with our claymore. 
This finishes off the fourth of the four horsemen and brings us to our fight against Calamity Ganon looking like Pennywise from the end of It. So right away, Rosin gets off two quick arrow shots to the dome while Ganon winds up for a horizontal swinging attack. Rosin then jumps to dodge the horizontal attack during the window that allows for Flurry Rush to be activated, letting us get a bunch of hits in to start the fight. We then retreat to the edge of the arena while whistle sprinting to pick up a royal broadsword as well as some explosive arrows. Rosin will swap to the explosive arrows right away and just unload on Ganon's face with them before repositioning slightly to pick up another royal claymore. After a couple more explosive arrows to bring us down to two remaining, Rosin swaps to his two ice arrows to use those real quick and then to some standard arrows to whittle down its health some more. We want to hold on to the two remaining explosive arrows for something that'll happen in a moment, but for now Rosin continues to chip away with arrows and then we'll switch focus to deal some damage via another flurry rush. After the flurry rush, Ganon is going to be shocked at how Zelda is actually Neo, and Ganon will retreat to climb up a wall, but this is where one of our remaining explosive arrows comes in handy to knock down the spoder. This transitions us to phase 2 where Ganon is now made out of lava because of course he is. Right away, Rosin waits for Ganon to fire a laser, which Rosin parries with his shield to deflect it back, stunning Ganon for a moment and letting us get a couple hits in on his head, before Beyblading amongst Ganon's legs to deal a bunch of hits super quickly. The strong slam attack at the end of the spin stuns Ganon again, so we then rinse and repeat after swapping to our Claymore. Rosin will repeat this process over and over until Ganon's health is almost empty, at which point we yeet our weapon to finish off the fight against Calamity Ganon. That isn't the end of the run though because there's one more boss fight after this one against Dark Beast Ganon, but real quick while we wait on this fight to end in that one to start, thank you to all of you who support the channel on Patreon. It's super kind of you to do and also unnecessary and it means a lot. It's the best way to support the channel financially if you're interested in doing so and also gives you perks like access to videos early and a patron role in my Discord server. Again, thank you and I hope you enjoy the content. So when we're brought into the true final fight of the game against Dark Beast Ganon, right away we're given the Bow of Light as well as a horse. At the start of this fight, we hear that princess chick talking and the fight doesn't actually start until the line where she tells us that she believes in our victory, which is a short line compared to the others. Rosin spends the time before this line just waiting for it and positions himself on the right side of Ganon's body. Or, well, I guess on Ganon's left. Rosin then tells Seabiscuit to giddy up right before the line starts so that we're in position on Ganon's right when the fight begins, because that's where the first three targets spawn that we have to hit with arrows. When the targets eventually spawn, we're going to immediately shoot at the front one and then jump off our steed to enter bullet time to be able to take out the other two targets in rapid succession. Also, this gives us more time to aim at the rear target, which is helpful because that one is a bit more finicky than the others. After then chasing down Bojack to mount him again, Rosin moseys his way around the front of Ganon, but we're in no rush at this moment because we're really just waiting on Ganon to make his move and slowly turn and do a dramatic laser to the sky, after which the next three targets will spawn. Once Ganon finishes his laser light show, Rosin again leaps off of American Pharaoh and enters bullet time to take out the three targets, lowering Ganon's health to around 25%. After mounting Boxer for the final time, Rosin rides around the front of Ganon to bait him into performing a powerful laser attack, but it's not very hard to dodge because we just keep on a truck into the other side of Ganon and then underneath him to wait for the next target to spawn on his navel. It's worth mentioning that this Dark Beast Ganon fight as a whole is a cakewalk compared to the rest of the run and there aren't many places where you can lose time. You mostly just have to be sure to hit the targets quickly and not get stomped on by any of Ganon's feet when you're riding under him. Speaking of under him, now that we're beneath Ganon, Rosin's timing is impeccable, hitting the target pretty much the moment it spawns and then begins riding out in front of Ganon. We're getting ready for the final blow of the fight and the game, where after dismounting Mr. Ed, Rosin is going to ride an updraft and float there while he waits for the axe wound on top of Ganon to open up for him to unload into. The run officially ends when Rosin's shot hits the target and the explosion animation begins.
If you made it to the end of this video, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of both myself and Rosin. This run holds a special place in speedrunning, and I'm glad that I got to work with Rosin on showing it to you guys. Rosin was awesome to work with on this video, and he's a super skilled runner, so please be sure to check out his socials, links are in the description. That's all for this video though. Let me know your thoughts on it by either leaving a comment below or joining my Discord server, link is in the description. This was an any% percent speedrun of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, I've been Tomato Anus, and I hope you have an above average day.